In the first part of the program, you got to know the electronic components and saw how huge numbers of them are used in integrated circuits, how they're combined to make control units, and how these are connected to form the vehicle's electrical system. This part of the program deals with how control units work, how data is stored, and how stored data is transferred in a process known as flashing. This is a modern engine control unit with many different integrated circuits. Move your mouse over the control unit and click the electronic components for more information on them. This is an analog to digital converter with several analog inputs. These input modules register the signals from the lambda probes. These output modules are for heating the lambda probes. The multiple output module controls various actuators in the vehicle, such as servo motors, injection valves and relays. This output module controls the throttle valve. The multiple output module controls various actuators in the vehicle, such as servo motors, injection valves and relays. This integrated circuit contains the power supply for all the other integrated circuits as well as other functions. This large storage module contains the volatile data collected while the engine is running. This special module regulates the knock control system. This output module controls the ignition. This is an interface module for connecting to bus systems. This storage module contains the instructions used by the processor. It also contains data such as the engine control characteristics. The microprocessor is the heart of the control unit and contains the most complex integrated circuit. It controls the recording of input values, performs the calculations and generates actuator signals. This housing contains a quartz crystal. Its vibrations control the timing frequency of the microprocessor. This is a storage module which contains the permanent data in the control unit. This is a sensor which records the ambient air pressure. This simplified diagram shows the components you found on the circuit board. The microprocessor is in the middle, the memory modules at the top, the inputs on the left, the outputs on the right, and the bus connection at the bottom. Move your mouse over the diagram to see the names of the components. Did you notice that there are three types of memory module? First, there are those that contain permanent data. These are called ROM. Then there are those that contain constantly changing data, such as that which is collected while driving. These are known as RAM. Finally, there are those whose data is only occasionally changed. These are called EEPROM or flash memory.
In the following section, you will learn about how these storage modules work. Let's start with the RAM storage modules. Every cell in the RAM consists of a transistor circuit. The last transistor in each set of eight circuits is shown here. In total, therefore, it is a single byte among many thousands. If the transistor is on, the output status is low. A zero is stored, for example. If it is off and the output is high, a one is stored. The content of the RAM storage cells can be changed at any time by the processor activating the transistors. RAM units only store their content as long as they receive a power supply. If the power supply is interrupted, the data is lost, which is why it is called volatile memory. You can find more details on this in the additional information. ROM units receive their data when the storage module is produced. The diodes in the storage cell are either deliberately destroyed by surge voltage or left intact. An intact diode behaves like an activated transistor. The cell might contain a zero. The destroyed diode has a high resistance, like a transistor in the off state, and therefore counts as a one. The contents of the memory cannot be changed and remain intact even when the power supply is interrupted. Modern control units contain EEPROM storage, also known as flash memory. The storage cells contain field effect transistors. A capacitor plate, which is either charged with voltage or not, acts as the gate. The voltage controls the source drain path. An activated path results in a zero, while a deactivated path results in a one. It is important that the path is regulated while no current is flowing. Once an electric charge is applied to the gate, it remains there for a long time, even if the power supply is switched off. On the other hand, the capacitor charge can be changed if necessary so that new data is stored. To find out more, open the additional information. Now that you know roughly how a control unit is structured, particularly the storage modules, we can take a look at how a control unit works. This is mainly to do with the microprocessor. The microprocessor works through the following steps in cycles. Input. The data is read. Processing. The data is processed. Where necessary, the data is linked to information in the storage modules. Output. The data is generated. This principle of operation can be clearly illustrated using the interior lighting control. The control unit reads the signals from the door contact switches. Is one of the door contact switches closed? Yes, the interior lighting must be on. No, the interior lighting must be off. The output switches the interior lighting accordingly. This process is constantly repeated, so that the control unit reacts immediately. Try it out for yourself. However, the microprocessor does not use words as commands. To process data, it uses various switching logic functions, which are encoded in a small number of bytes. Theoretically, three logical connections are all it takes to represent any computation. OR, AND, AND NOT. The example of the door illumination shows the OR connection. The signal from the door contact switch on the left, OR, the one on the right, determines the state of the interior lighting. Try the circuit out here. For an exact definition of the connections used in switching logic, as well as a graphic illustration, see the additional information. The switching logic connections can be easily realized using the semiconductors you learned about in the first part of the program. Here are three examples. 
Finally, you can see the circuits in the calculation unit of a microprocessor. Try out the various switch positions to see what happens at the output.